cool? Can you guys hear me properly? Good for the people in the back? All right. Uh, thank you for coming. I hope everyone stays awake after lunch. Lunch was good. Uh, my name is John Kelly. As they mentioned, uh, I'm the creator of Dioxys. So Dioxys is a cross-platform UI library for Rust. That's why we're here. Uh, for the past year, I worked at Cloudflare on Zero Trust. Uh, and like they said, I now get to work on Dioxys full-time. So everything you love about Dioxys today should hopefully get better and well into the future. Uh, and I'm super excited about that. So we have a lot of new features planned for Dioxys. Some stuff we're going to cover in this talk. Uh, and I, I hope we can release it quickly over the coming weeks and months. Uh, my goal for this talk is to showcase a lot of the unique design decisions that went into, the di it went into Dioxys over the past year so that the community and the Rust GUI authors have inspiration for their own projects. So we're going to do a little bit of live coding, show off some of the cool features, dive into some of the weird architectural decisions that we've made, uh, and hopefully inspire you to go build the 51st Rust GUI library. <laughs> so with Dioxys, we're on a mission to fix cross-platform app development. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff wrong with cross-platform app development right now. So in 2023, your users expect a lot. They expect apps that run everywhere. On your phone, you probably have Spotify installed. I pay $15 a month for Spotify, so I expect Spotify to work on all of my devices. I have it installed on my desktop. I have it installed on my phone. I expect it to work on the web, smart speakers, smart TVs, smart watches. Pretty much anywhere with a screen and a speaker, Spotify should work. So if one of you, an aspiring, humble, indie app developer, wanted to compete with Spotify for whatever reason, your users would expect that your app would work everywhere that Spotify works. But there's a big problem. As an indie app developer, how are you expected to maintain an app on every single platform, especially a native app? Across Mac, Linux, Windows, iOS, TVs, you need to know like hundreds of different technologies and like seven, eight different programming languages? You can't, you can't do that. So there are options that simplify this. Uh, not a lot of them are that great. So if you play within Apple's walled garden, then you can get pretty far with Swift UI and UI Kit. It seems like a lot of people here are networking, so Swift UI and UI Kit are these libraries for drawing uh, apps to the screen on Apple's platforms. They don't support the web, but they do give you pretty decent code reuse across all of Apple's devices. You can share code from your smartwatch to your iPhone to a desktop app. But that being said, you are glued to everyone's favorite editor, Xcode. <laughs> You need Apple hardware to develop an app, which sucks. And you really can't serve the 3.3 billion people running Android and surprisingly 1.3 billion people running WeChat mini apps. <laughs> so what are your options? If you stick with JavaScript and React, then you have some decent choices. If you're going to build a desktop app, you can use Electron. If you want to build a mobile app, you can use React Native. And you want to do a full stack web app, Next.js has your back. But each of these projects have some pretty big trade-offs. Now, everyone hates Electron because you're, you're basically shipping Chrome just to run like Spotify or a little simple to-do list. So you're bloating your users' computers 200, 300 megabytes per app. React Native is also sort of a challenging development environment. You, run, you quickly run into issues with memory usage on lower-end devices. The performance isn't always there. And you don't really have the flexibility to design UIs the way you, you want. Next.js is actually really good for doing full stack web development, but you can't really share any of your Next.js code with your React Native app or your Electron app. And that's really the biggest pain here. If you're an indie app developer, you want to share your code everywhere across all the platforms. If you build a button or slider for React Native, you can't share it with your Next.js project. Some logic can be reused, sure, some libraries, but if you're relating if you're relying on any sort of native libraries, you just can't get a React Native project to share any code with a Next.js project. Now, there are a lot of options up here. Uh, we have Cordova. I don't know if anyone's used that. Uh, Zamarian, Tauri, which is a popular one in the Rust community, and Flutter. And I think Flutter is the closest analog to what we're trying to do with Dioxys. So Flutter fits the bill. It gives you a ton of features. It's made by Google, but it has one major downside. You need to know Dart. And I, I don't know Dart. I don't know anyone else who knows Dart. <laughs> OK, we got some hands. Uh, the Dart ecosystem is limited to Dart. You can't really just pull in a Rust package. There is a really cool Rust crate that allows you to use the Flutter renderer 
So you get the entire Rust ecosystem and you get to render, render with Flutter. But that's kind of still just this icky system that I don't want to have to deal with. I don't want Dart in my project. I just want 100% Rust. That's why we're here, Rust NL. So we want Rust completely in the stack. So we've talked a lot about apps. But we're here at Rust NL. We should be talking about Rust. And that's where this conversation is going to go now. I assume we all love Rust. We love Cargo, Rust Doc, portable binaries, strong type system, no seg faults, all that great stuff. So we have all these superpowers. What is the Rust community's answer to this cross-platform app development problem? Well, <laughs> until now, Rust's app story has been pretty immature. Obviously, to start building an app, you need a GUI library. If you can believe it, there are over 50 Rust GUI libraries, and yet there's no clear winner. But the ecosystem seems to agree. They've created over 50 GUI libraries. Rust could be an amazing language for app development. Apparently, we just haven't figured it out yet. Maybe the 51st GUI library will solve it. So that begs the question, as a community, how do we get on the same page? What do we need to make a viable alternative to Flutter or React Native? So I personally think the solution that will come out of Rust has to play into Rust's strengths. And it comes down to basically three main points. Number one, Rust can cross-compile basically everywhere in a way that makes JavaScript insanely jealous. You can run Rust on ARM components, x86, STEAM32, WebAssembly. There's no user or target Rust can't reach right now. Our UIs should be the same. Our widgets and buttons and components should look and feel the same no matter the target. If I spend an hour wasting my time to make a button look pretty for my web app, I want that exact same button to look the same for my mobile app. Number two, Rust gives us the power to manually manage memory and performance. Authors should be making their libraries so fast that nobody even bothers to look at benchmarks. It's Rust. It scales, it's blazingly fast, even on toasters. We know. <laughs> Number three, and I think this is the most important, this is near and dear to my heart, Rust prioritizes developer experience. If you look at a lot of the Rust GUI libraries right now, they have a lot of like rough corners. They're not the easiest to work with. They got clumsy APIs. So we can do better, right? We love Cargo. We love Rust Doc. We love the integrated testing that Rust gives you and the great error messages. So as GUI library authors, we should really be leaning into this and focus on designing clean, simple libraries that make the appropriate trade-offs between performance and development speed. We should be seeking to find a good enough solution without getting caught up in the ideological weeds. So that's where Dioxys comes in. With these three pillars in mind, I spent the past two years, nights and weekends, putting tons of hours into building Dioxys. So for the rest of today's talk, we're going to deep we're going to dive deep into the design of Dioxys and explore many of its interesting architectural decisions. So at a glance, Dioxys is declarative and component-based. It's inspired by React, for better or for worse, and it uses a virtual DOM. It targets the web, desktop, mobile, the terminal, live view, which is this like, cool new rendering target, uh, and honestly, a bunch more targets. It has exceptional performance. It's top of the pack. We put a lot of work into making it as quick as possible. It also supports some integrated hot reloading and some spiffy dev tools. So we're going to cover that pretty. We're going to cover that in the talk. Um, but if you don't know a whole lot about GUIs and user interfaces, you might get caught up on what declarative and component-based means. When I say Daxis is component-based, that means Daxis is made by composing your user interfaces using functions that describe the layout. These functions do things like encapsulate state, handle user input, and they're composed of their own subcomponents. You never really explicitly create individual elements with Dioxys. Instead, you simply pass your RSX markup into Dioxys, which handles the drawing for you. And the mechanism that handles this drawing to the screen for you is called a virtual DOM. So Dioxys, for, again, like I said, for better or for worse, if you kind of keep up with all the drama in the JavaScript world, uses a virtual DOM. So this is not new in the field of UI library design. React did it, and libraries before React did it. So I'm going to paraphrase React's documentation here. They do a pretty good job of 
explaining what a virtual DOM is. And this is pretty core to understanding a lot of the features that come out of Dioxys. The virtual DOM is a programming concept where an ideal or virtual representation of a UI is kept in memory and synced with the real DOM by libraries such as Dioxys. This process is called reconciliation. This approach enables the declarative API of Dioxys. You tell Dioxys what state you want, and it makes sure that the DOM matches that state. This abstracts the typically error-prone manual manipulation of DOM elements that you would otherwise have to do for your apps. If you've ever written any UI kit in Apple land, you know how hard it is to keep your UIs in sync with complicated user interaction. Whenever the state of your app changes, Doxus will render your components. And because components are functions, Doxus is just simply calling those functions and returning an element. Doxus assembles these elements into a, a tree or a virtual DOM. It determines any changes necessary between the old state and the new state. And then it takes those list of changes and it sends that to a renderer, which knows how to patch the screen and draw your widgets and squares and circles and text. So, I've talked a lot. Uh, I want to show off some live coding, so you're going to have to bear with me while I futz with the prompt prompter. Um, cool. So we should all see my desktop. So, everybody can see this, right? Oh, wow, VS Code looks weird. Fun. Okay. So this is like the simplest Dioxys desktop app you can build. We import the prelude at the top, typical Rust fashion. In our main, we are using Dioxys desktop, which is a renderer, and we're calling the launch function. All of the Dioxys renderers sport a launch function, which basically takes over the thread that you're on and runs the virtual DOM. Uh, when we launch the app, we have to give it a component. In this case, we have an app component. All components in Dioxys are just functions, so they're really simple. You don't need a struct with a derive or an impl, so we can get down to a hello world that is six li or 11 lines of code. And we can code golf this down to three, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it's pretty simple. You call render on some markup. Uh, this is typically provided by this RSX macro. There are alternative macros you can use. Hate it or love it, you have to use macros if you do Dioxys. Uh, this RSX macro is this sort of weird, custom, funky dialect of Rust that we put together. So if you know Rust, it's pretty easy to build user interfaces using RSX. Uh, and then we pass in some markup. So we'll just run our app here. And boom, we have an app. It's pretty quick, too. Uh, there, are, there are 300 dependencies. Not all of them are us. A lot of that is Tokyo, but you know, <laughs> don't look too closely. Um, we can iterate on this, so we can create a bunch more header elements. Cool, yeah, that's what you think it does. Um, it's important to note that this is actually HTML and CSS, and that is an architectural decision in of itself. And what I talked about, we made a bunch of interesting architectural decisions. One of those is sticking with the lingua franca of the web, HTML, CSS. That means you don't have to learn anything new. If you've been doing web development for 20 years, you've walked through PHP, WordPress, Laravel, you know, all of those technologies, you can keep all of that knowledge you've retained over the years. You don't have to throw anything out. So if you go want to build a desktop app, you're still using HTML and CSS. You want to build a mobile app, HTML and CSS. They're not the sharpest tools in the shed, but they get the job done. So we can do things like wrap this header element in a div. And then we can, we can give it a border. And uh, Copilot completes it for us. We can run it. And we got a border. So it's pretty quick. That's just the HTML and CSS knowledge that is imbued in Copilot. So I don't even know, I don't even have to know HTML and CSS to, to get by. Uh, what's pretty cool is because it is just HTML and CSS, we're able to bring all of the documentation from Mozilla straight into your editor. So this is pretty cool. This is going to be magic here for you in a second. If I hover the, over this H1 element, all of the Mozilla MDN docs are available to me right now. I don't have to go open a window and figure out what the H1 element does is right there. And we can even click the H1 element, and it takes us to the documentation. So it's pretty cool, right? Yeah? How many, how many Rust UI frameworks do that? All right. Cool. So I like to be lazy. I don't like this 6 star render stuff. I like just render. 
shortens the, the code a little bit. So this uh, render macro can take a bunch of interesting Rust semantics and tokens. Uh, we can do things like uh, attach assets. So, oh great, Copilot did it. We can add an image tag, and because this is just HTML and CSS, it's an image. Uh, this will automatically pull from the file system, and we get a, a logo on screen. It's pretty easy. Imagine how hard that would be if you were doing this in like anything else. Okay. Uh, you can even map like iterators in conditionals in uh, this RSX dialect. So zero, we're gonna map it to five, map I, RSX, and then I. Cool. And then we can see it renders zero, one, two, three, four. So iterators map in pretty easily. So it's pretty, pretty simple to, to do things like rendering lists. And we can even do things like rendering conditionals. Let me get rid of this. So if true, or code goes here. Cool, and we have code goes here. You can see it. So it's pretty simple to, to compose your user interfaces using the RSX macro. Um, we can get pretty complicated with it. We can even add, uh, let's say, some sort of event handler onto this header element. So we can add an on click, and then we just print. Clicked. Oops, so running that. So now whenever we click the header, it's not a button, but it's still clickable, we can see that click gets printed. So it's pretty easy to add like interactive functionality to your markup. Uh, what's important to understand, and we talked about this virtual DOM stuff, is that when our apps are rendered, they're only rendered when we tell them to be. So rendered. In this case, oops, we're still running the app. In this case, we see that the component is rendered only once. And when we click the title, it doesn't get re-rendered. So this exists in uh, React as well. You have to tell React that this component is dirty and needs to be re-rendered. Typically, you go through use state, set state. Uh, but in Dioxys, you can just do it explicitly. So we still have this going on. Six dot needs update. And what this does is, uh, it renders the app the first time to get the stuff to the screen. Then when we click it, we get clicked, printed, and then the app is re-rendered. So when Dioxys goes to reconcile the state of your app, it will take the old state and the new state, compare the differences, it's called diffing, and then send those changes to the, uh, to the renderer. Now, we have no state that is changing, uh, but we do have the component re-rendering. So let's add some state that changes. Uh, that's pretty easy, so let val equals cx.use state. Uh, this use state method is just a way of attaching some state into this component without having to declare a struct. Explicit state management is done just through these like little creation functions. So this value will be evaluated to zero when it's initialized and we can go modify it after the fact. Uh, what's cool is that, or use hook, sorry. Use hook. What's cool is that this is giving us a mutable reference to a value. If you've like worked with Rust UI libraries, this might seem just like really weird, right? This is a function, it's, it's, it's not a struct, there's no impl, there's no props, it's sort of like flipping the paradigm on its head a little bit. And we're, we have a, a mutable reference to some value that we can modify. Uh, but what's, what's really cool is that we can map the value into this dynamic text, and at the same time, we can modify it. Plus equals one. So, you probably won't see this in a lot of other Rust frameworks. There's no clones going on. There's no weird semantics. It's actually, it looks just like JavaScript. And what we're doing is, is using the lifetime system of Rust to our advantage. This val has an and mute to some value, right? So this lifetime of the value is actually threaded between scope and element, which means the on click handler is also sharing the lifetime of scope and element. You don't see the lifetimes because they're hidden here, but if we hover over it, you see this like tick A lifetime. What Rust is doing is aligning the lifetime for us. It's making it a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier to work with. Um, it's hiding some of the annoyances, but we go run the app, it compiles, we click the title, and it increments. It looks like JavaScript, right? It's pretty crazy. I think that's crazy, I don't know about you guys. Uh, in practice, you will compose these primitives together. So uh, we provide you the use state uh, hook, 
val equals u state, which essentially we did that save state into a hook and that needs update. This uh, u state value, u state hook just combines both of that into this cool functionality. I'm going to make this mutable. Uh, cool. Well, and we don't even need needs update anymore. So this is pretty, this is pretty slick. Uh, essentially, we've overridden the plus equals operator, the add assign operator in Rust, which whatever handle this use state is giving us, it's not a normal value, it's a use state that's generic over some type. In this case, it's generic over uh, in I32. Whenever we do this plus equals, because we've overridden that trait, uh, that needs update and set state is happening all at once. So a little bit clever, a little bit hidden behind the scenes, but very clean. So again, we got this going on. Cool. So, I said before that in Diaxis, your user interfaces are composed of subcomponents. So we're going to do a thing here. We're going to abstract our state away, and we're also going to clean things up. But we're at it. So we cleaned up our app component. We're going to make a new app component. Six scope element. We're going to call this one a fancy button. We'll make a bunch of them. So very quickly, in like five seconds, I was able to abstract that button component that we had been iterating on and to its own component. And now we have a new app that is rendering for those buttons. And hopefully, if I run this, we should see four buttons. Or actually, four headers in this case. So and each one has its own state encapsulated inside of it. So this was pretty quick. Like in the span of like five minutes, we spun up an app that has four counters self-contained in their own you know, little domains. They're, they're like tiny little render loops that are all disconnected, and the state is separated. So if we wanted to share state among these fancy buttons, uh, we would add some sort of props. And if you're familiar with React, React has props. They're just a, like a blob of values that you can pass in. In Rust, we use a struct. Struct fancy button props. Text. We'll just use a static string. And we're going to derive partial equal and props. Uh, by default, Doxus requires you to implement partial equal for your props. This means it actually compares your properties when it goes to check if the component should be re-rendered. If the properties haven't changed, the component won't be re-rendered. This is a little deviant from React, which always re-renders your component, and you have to explicitly opt into memoization. With Dioxys, you opt out of memoization. So it's much faster by default, and it's a little bit easier to reason about. Uh, I'm going to save the file, and we should get an error. Oh, actually, no. Hold on. We actually have to use the props. So now we get an error. Uh, this is, we're kind of abusing Rust, uh, like expansion macros, but if you look, if you look real closely, we tried, to, we tried our best to give a good error. Uh, fancy button props builder error missing required field text. Uh, you, can, you can kind of figure out what's going on here. Uh, at least, hey, at least we get a strong type system. At least it doesn't compile. Uh, yeah, cool. So this will compile. Two, three, four. Now in our buttons, we haven't actually used this state yet. So what we can do is, uh, hello RustNL. Let's change this to a button real quick. Uh, and then we'll put the cx.props.txt. Again, this compiles. Everything's working. Cool. You should see buttons. They're small. Okay, we're zoomed in. All right, you get a button. You see how this one says one, two, three, four? Cool, so we've abstracted state. We're sharing it from parents to children. You kind of get the React model. What's cool is how clean everything is and how it all just like fits together. It's certainly one of the cleanest Rust libraries for managing state out there. Cool. Uh, if we wanted to go a little bit cleaner, we totally could. Uh, instead of having this fancy button props struct, we can just abstract this out. Whoa. Copy this text. We have yet another macro. I hope you love macros, because we have lots of them. <laughs> cool. What this is doing is uh, sort of expanding the function arguments of this component into properties on its own. And we have a bunch of like special cases for things like event handlers and uh, lifetime management that's you know behind the scenes. It's not as powerful as it could be if you're using a struct definition but it's very quick to throw apps together. If you go look at some of the 
the apps that are seriously using Dioxys, this is all over the place because people are lazy and they like macros when it helps them out. Uh, yeah, and this does exactly what you think it does. We have our buttons again. This is not the most illuminating demo in the world, but you know, it works, it's cool. Uh, there's a lot more like features of Dioxys, but this is like a good overview of the core system that's going on. Um, I think that's it for like this little bit of live demo portion, but I kind of want to show some more interesting stuff. Um, we'll clear out this fancy button real quick. Here come here. Um, I have some snippets that are helpful. I said that Dioxys targets a bunch of targets, right? Desktop, web, mobile. Well, you can actually do it in the same file using config. So, which one? Other world. Cool. So, on WASM targets, WebAssembly, when we target Rust for the web, it will use Dioxys Web to launch the app. When we're targeting non WASM targets, like my local computer, it will use Dioxys Desktop to launch the app. So, we can run our app. We'll just do cargo run. And we get a desktop app. Okay, right? We've been seeing that the whole time. Well, we can do Dioxys serve. We do a little bit of a compile. We go to our address. The same app is now rendered in the web. So we've got two targets under one code base. So literally, the same code base works everywhere. Um, we can even do mobile. Setting up mobile takes a while, so I have it like prefabbed out. Uh, we've got our, our mobile. We have just a, a simple code base that is, uh, this is like a to-do MVC. It's like the basic to-do app that everyone stresses their framework with. Uh, the code is not necessarily important. The, the artifact is. So we can run our app. Build succeeded, great. Live demos actually work. We've got an iPhone. Hey, we have a, a mobile app written in Rust on iOS. And it actually works. I hope it works. Rust, no. Oh, cool, it does, all right, to do. All right, so yeah, yeah, it's a it's typical to-do app. You can hide, complete, cool, all right. So we got, what do we show? We got desktop, we got mobile, we got web. What else do we have up our sleeves? Well, we have the terminal. I think this one is really cool. Uh, this is, this is React in your terminal. And you can hover at 120 frames per second. <laughs> That's pretty cool, right? Uh, the colors change, you know, it's kind of trippy. I've never seen a terminal app that looks like this before. This is, this is super cool. All right. Okay, all right, I'm just like super into that. Uh, we also have a web GPU based renderer. So if you like trippy squares, this one's gonna be real fun. Okay, all right, we're gonna have to zoom in. So this is an HTML CSS renderer. Uh, it's not 100% compatible yet, you know, we're getting there. Building a browser takes a while. Uh, we have solved CSS layout. So Flexbox, we have a project called Taffy, which has implemented uh, most of Flexbox, a good chunk of CSS grid. It's not, you know, 100% browser compatible. I don't think we'll ever get there, but it's good enough. It's good enough that I can move my mouse around and we can like click on buttons and, you know, do things. And this is just all written with like that same HTML CSS syntax. It even has like tab. So you can, you have like tab index, which is another browser theme. So things like doing focusing and that kind of stuff. Uh, even has like keyboard input. So I hit space, I change the color. Pretty cool. We can uh, make it bigger. If you like trippy squares, we got them. <laughs> uh, it's, it's pretty quick. I, it's not quite 120 frames per second. It's more like 50 to 60, depending on how many squares you're rendering. Um, we're relying on Velo, which is uh, an API written by uh, Raf Linus. He's like known for Xylem, Druid. So we're kind of leaning on the, the community at large to implement a lot of these things. This could easily be implemented with MakePads rendering engine, which is pretty cool. So we're super renderer agnostic. Uh, we don't really care what we're rendering with as long as there is a renderer. Uh, we can keep adding tiles. At some point it slows down because we're not running in release. Yeah, yeah, we're not running release, so you know, it slows down at some point. Cool. Uh, I have another cool app to show you. This is more of like a an app that's being used in production. So this is kind of, this is like top secret. I'm, I don't know if I'm supposed to show you this, but it's a full production app that's being shipped with Dioxys today. Uh, there are 900 dependencies in this app, by the way. So it, it takes minutes to compile, but not in incremental mode. Uh, cool. 
So this is, this is like a Discord competitor. Uh, there are chats you can like scroll through. Uh, this is a desktop app we're running in like release mode. Um, we can have favorites, we can unfavorite things. You can go to our settings, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, the access desktop supports like pop out windows so we can click on our images and cool. So we get a, a nice beautiful Instagram worthy photo. Um, and all of this is done within like the same toolkit and it works everywhere. Um, I don't think you're gonna be like shipping a lot of this to the web. There's some like specific technologies that are using like the desktop type libraries. There's like a federated protocol. But you totally could if you wanted to. If you want to go through the hassle of getting these libraries working on WebAssembly, totally possible. Uh, sorry? Oh, <laughs> I don't know if it would work in the terminal. I would be super pumped if it did, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if we can render images in the terminal yet. There, there are technologies. Uh, yeah, so this kind of just goes to show you can like use Diaxis from the smallest of apps that we like live coded together to the biggest of apps that are trying to take on you know, major competitors like Discord and Slack and, and what have you. Um, that's it, I think, for the demos. So we're gonna, we're gonna hop back into the presentation. Uh, so there's a bunch of like takeaway innovations from all this work. Um, for one, we discovered very early on that it made sense to batch the changes that we we're making to the, to the screen. So when we go to reconcile the old and the new, before we would say the old is different from the new in this particular way and we would immediately go patch the screen. Now if your app is big enough, that actually takes a while. It could be on the order of milliseconds. And a new frame could have been requested between the start and the end of that. What makes sense for Diaxis is to batch all of the mutations into a list. So instead of going one by one, we accumulate everything together and it's actually a lot more efficient, especially when you're operating over in FFI layer. In most of our renderers, the Rust code is not living in the same process as the renderer. So in the case of a web view, the web view window is running in its own process and your Diaxis code is running in another process and you have to communicate. If you patched the, the screen one by one, it would be really slow. So we, we bunch everything up into like a list of mutations uh, and we can send it over the network. This is pretty cool because as long as any client implements the Diaxis mutation model, it can be driven by virtual DOM. So we have a live view client, which is pretty cool, which is the virtual DOM living on a server and a client living in someone's browser. And the server can drive all of the updates to the page without shipping any JavaScript or any Rust down. So just some HTML, a small JavaScript shim layer that implements the, the Diaxis mutation model, and there you go. You have a client that can operate via Diaxis. Uh, we also discovered, and this is important for other GUI libraries that are working in the WASM space, that string interning is super helpful in WebAssembly. If you don't know, uh, Rust stores its strings in UTF-8, but all the browsers store their strings in UTF-16. So anytime a string has to move out of WebAssembly into JavaScript, it has to be encoded and decoded. And if you're doing that a lot, even for the same strings, it gets really expensive really fast. So one thing we discovered, and we're trying to get this out in the air so everybody's really fast, is that you can intern all these strings at that boundary. And we kind of took this model a little bit further uh, with something called Sledgehammer. So we, we interned all of the strings that you could think of that are relevant to the web model, and we put all of the batching together, and we made it so fast that it's actually faster than vanilla JavaScript. Uh, there could just be like noise in the test harness, uh, but it's really cool. It's, it's faster than WASM Bindgen, which is the library that typically people go through to build their apps with. So Daxis is not actually using WASM Bindgen under the hood. We have uh, handwritten UTF-8, UTF-16 decoders with this like bloom filter and a string in interning engine. So it's pretty complicated, but it's exceptionally fast. And you can use Sledgehammer for your own projects, so you know, there's only a few downloads of it, but it's, it's super helpful. Another thing we discovered, and it's not, I don't want to claim the discovery for this. We're sort of building on past projects that prove this, and GPU APIs have done this for a long time, but this technique of double buffering. So React creates a lot of garbage. When you say create element and it creates a tree, there's tons of objects and strings and callbacks that are being allocated. In Rust, we would typically stuff this in a box, uh, and then you're hitting the global allocator a lot, and you're always trying to find out how big the items are before putting them into the heap. 
and rest people seem extremely averse to the heap at all. Uh, so we were too. Uh, so we have our own heap, um, which is a little crazy, but it's just a, like a linear swath of memory. So you're going to put a string in, it goes in. You put another string in, it goes in right after that one. And you can sort of assemble these two bump allocators side by side for the old and the new. This is really, really cool because you get steady state memory consumption for each component. And we actually recycle these bump allocators. So your memory usage, at least vis-a-vis -vis Dioxys, maybe not your code, I don't know how bad your code is, but our code is great. Uh, Dioxys will only use as much memory as the maximum amount of memory that you've ever used. Once you hit that limit, it will never grow past that. So we can stuff all these lifetimes into this bump allocator, and it's extremely fast. And we get lifetimes starting through the entire system. Uh, something we did recently, which is super, super cool, and is being actually copied in the JavaScript world uh, by like million JS. I don't know who did it first. I think we did, but I don't know. Uh, we're actually able to statically analyze the macros, the R6 macros, and figure out what's dynamic in this world and what is static. So when your code gets compiled, we give every RSX call a unique ID. And this is basically just like the location in the code base. Uh, we're hashing your Rust tokens a little bit to get that unique ID so we're not colliding. The real features we need are stuck in nightly and we're not going to run on nightly. Uh, but what this lets us do is figure out what parts of the template are static and what are dynamic. And when we go to diff the templates, we only look at the dynamic portions. So in this case, if we see this particular template show up, this RSX call, and we see div and div, we know that's not going to change. And we can make that decision at compile time. So when we go and run, the only thing that gets diffed or checked or allocated, really, is that val entry in the paragraph. So this expands to this like template thing at compile time and a list of dynamic nodes. It's a huge architecture shift, but it's extremely fast. It's so fast that it's faster than like a signal-based API. It's as fast as like million.js or Inferno. We're not quite as fast as solid.js, and we're kind of using JavaScript to like benchmark, and we still have this like interning problem to deal with, but it is super fast. It's amazing. Uh, we also have auto-formatting of RSX, which I didn't show off, but you know, whatever. Um, this is another interesting takeaway for Rust library authors. You can actually use the sin representation of the Rust token stream in multiple contexts. So if you've written a proc macro before, and uh, I don't know if you have, but they're fun, they're terrible. Uh, uh, essentially what you do is you take this token stream object and you try to parse out Rust tokens into these structs that you define yourself. So you're implementing the parse straight for a struct that you've written. We have a public API for the RSX syntax tree, essentially, the abstract syntax tree, and it can be used in two ways. One, you can spit out the resulting token stream, which is that those template definitions, or you can run it through the auto formatter and spit out properly formatted text. So anyone who's doing macros and sort of like steal our architecture and your users can get properly auto-formatted macros. We have a ticket open on Rust format to, to integrate some of this, but I don't think that's ever going to be merged. <laughs> uh, and my piece de resistance is uh, hot reloading. So we're gonna, we, we'll show this one a demo. Uh, the MakePad folks also have hot reloading. Hot reloading is like the hot thing right now. Um, but everyone knows that like compile time suck on the MakePad and they're like five seconds. Um, what we try to do is analyze the template at compile time, connect up those definitions we talked about earlier, and watch your code base. If your code base changes in a way that we don't need to recompile the REST code, we only need to reinterpret the RSX, then we can patch a running renderer. So this is my, my final slide, but all right, let's pray that this works. Okay, all right, I'll reload in it. Okay, cool. So we turned on hot reloading. It says connected to hot reloading, right? So in this H1, we can modify our content, and it gets updated live without having to recompile the rest of it. <laughs> and this is uh, super slick. So, whew. hold on, div. 
Okay, we need an auto formatter going on. We should get a bunch. We're going to even add new elements. I compile. That was pretty cool. We don't have to recompile anything. Uh, <laughs> border. Hey, hey, I know some CSS. One PX solid black. Oh, shit, there's a, there's a border. <laughs> cool. So you could like, feasibly see how we could like, build an entire app without having to recompile it. And this is good for like, designers, so we could like, build a tool that syncs to your code base without having to recompile the Rust app. The designer can just sit there, plug in all the HTML, add the CSS, and you know, that's pretty quick. You don't have to recompile. That's it. That's all I got. That's all my fun features of the day. Who's got questions? We got one here. Well, I might ask you some more questions afterwards as well. Okay. But um, I was, you, you showed something about the error messages within macros and them not always being ideal. Yeah. Is there anything you need from the Rust compiler to improve that, or can you improve that without that? Is there any way you can make that scenario better? I would love to see some action on the Rust compiler. It'd be great if we could have like span locations in stable. Uh, I think a lot of proc macro authors would care about that. Uh, to get really good errors out of proc macros, you need to do partial expansion, which is complicated, especially in our case. Um, so I think part of it is us figuring out partial expansion or maybe some sort of help on the, the Rust compiler side uh, for us to build these really good uh, error messages. I think reflection might be needed, but I don't know. No, but, no. but do you think you can make this better than it's right now? I think so. Okay. I think so, yeah. Um, what's the accessibility story, if any? <laughs> it's HTML and CSS. So you get all the accessibility that HTML and CSS has. Uh, you can open inspect element, uh, and you can start futzing around with the uh, you know, ARIA labels and stuff. Kind of up to you, the developer, to add those labels yourself. But screen readers work right out of the box, and that's kind of why we did this HTML and CSS pathway, yeah. So my question is, um, you know, the live reloading is, is really nice, but isn't the idea that you put inline Rust code into the render block, um, isn't that going to really mess that up? Yeah, so we have to make the decision, can we hot reload this or can we not? Uh, and let's, uh, we'll, we'll leave this open and we'll add something, 0.5.map, right, I, RSX. Uh, what this will say is, manually rebuild the project to view further changes. So we have to give up in some cases. We try not to ruin your running app, but we do have to give up if you make a change to the logic that we can't fix. So yeah. you serialize the state out and re -swap, swap it back in in a running application? That, that could be. Uh, we don't have that implemented yet, but it, you totally could serialize some of the state. It would require your state being serializable, which again requires reflection, but you know, totally possible. All right. So as a part-time React developer and full-time Rust enthusiast, this is really cool. Um, has anyone already built a router for the Oxus? Uh, yes, and I did it, and it sucks, and someone has rebuilt it, and it's way better, uh, and it should be coming out in the next major release. Um, there are wide open questions on what that should look like. Uh, we, want it, we want to be able to like, export the symbol and then be able to read the symbol to give you some like, visualization of your app's router. Um, not there yet, but there is a router, so you can you can do routery stuff. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Weird question, maybe, but uh, what exactly is string interning? Yeah. So, say you're you're passing strings in and out of uh, two different runtimes. Sometimes you're passing the same string in and out, and you're incurring a lot of overhead for moving that string between the boundaries. What you can do is hash that string and save it into like a vec or a hash map, and then instead of having to reassemble a string on the other side, you just pull an existing string out of the, some pool. It's very helpful for like large text blocks, that way you're not paying that serialization cost all the time. Um, I'm building an app with like web GPU rendering engine. Could I at some point build like a native app that uses the native app, uh, native, native renderer you were talking about um, for the UI? and has the full power of the GPU without being in a web view, and then still have the app in the browser with like the accessibility of the DOM? 
Yeah, that's the dream. Uh, it takes a lot of work to get there. You're kind of rebuilding a browser, but that's the dream. And what I really want to build is like a scientific visualization toolkit where most of it is in React, but you get a handle to like a web GPU context and you can render anything you want to it. So that's the, that's the goal. That would be really awesome. Yeah. Yeah, can you pass it back? There's one more question over there that oh, we're yeah. going to take, and then we have to move on. I was just curious, so how does it look on Android side of things, and does it still use Xcode for Apple compilation? Um, Android works. I don't have Android Studio installed on my Mac, but people in the community have got it working. Um, we're relying, again, we're leaning heavily on the ecosystem. The Tauri folks have done a lot of work in getting Tau and Rai, the, like the windowing and web view engines working on Android and iOS. Um, so we're kind of just piggybacking off their work. But it, Android works today. I haven't explored with it a lot. I, I don't run Android in my day to day, but I can tell you it works. Thanks, Jonathan, for your cool talk. <laughs> <laughs>